Hello, how's it going? So um, today I was going to do um, a book review. Uh, I want to get this back to the library. Uh, so uh, I'll have to just, you know, at least show you the book. Um, it's called The Last Founding Father, James Monroe and the Nation's Call to Greatness, uh, written by Harlow Giles Unger. Um, and I'll say this about James Monroe before I went into this. Like my, my first, like what I... Prior knowledge is that I knew that he was the president. I knew he was from Virginia. I knew that he had uh, been a major player in the revolution and in the early days of the United States, but as well as having that Monroe, Monroe Doctrine named after him and him actually giving it. Uh, I didn't know a ton about him. Um, I suppose that might be more than a lot of people, but as far as what I wanted to know, that obviously I read the book uh, as a um, just to get to know. Him. Um, and I'll say this about, you know, my first impressions about him. It seemed like he was a little less intellectual than the types of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Monroe. Um, but he was, uh, all those three guys actually never did any military time. They were not, did not fight the revolution. They basically, uh, sat around while the revolution happened. Uh, you know, Adams went over to drum up some money, but the other two were in politics. Um, maybe not necessarily suited. You know, it says Monroe was actually a, a pretty big guy for the time that he was about six feet, which to me, that's not very big because that's exactly the same height I am. But bear in mind that James Madison himself was about five feet. Um, and so he was a big burly farmer in those days. So, um, so he was in the military. He fought uh, under George Washington um, alongside uh, Alexander Hamilton. Um, and it seemed like he, the reason why he wasn't as intellectual was not because he was stupid or anything. That his education was interrupted because he was so young um, at the time of the revolution that he went to, to university at, at William and Mary and it was interrupted like maybe just a few months into his education and he was off for several years fighting the war with Washington. And so he, he got to see up close what George Washington was like, how he carried himself, you know, basically how he, he delegated all his tasks to his, his lieutenants and all that. And so I think he took that a lot, of, a lot of that on board. Um, and it seemed like it, the more you read in this, he just happened to be at the right time, the right place um, throughout his entire life. And he's always in the mix in every single aspect of the early days of the United States. And I just it just seems like I, he just he just he just couldn't do anything wrong, at least during, you know, he was always in the mix. And I kind of I find that interesting that he was always, you know, he was there to meet Napoleon, he was there to um, negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. He just seemed to be a part of every major aspect in the American Revolution and and the Constitution and the early days of the, of the Republic. Um, and so, uh, you know, like I said, that he lived in France, actually did two stints in France as a diplomat, um, traveled a bit to, to Britain to try to, uh, you know, try to negotiate. Um, this is after the Revolution, but Things were still tense with them, obviously having uh, later fighting a war with the um, uh, the British. Uh, you know, it didn't always work in you know, negotiation, but he really gave it a go. And you, I mean, the book is fairly biased, uh, very pro um, James Monroe. Like, there's not a lot of criticism in there. So maybe if I ever get around to it, I'll read another another biography on him. Uh, I still have, you know, like 40 presidents, 40 some presidents um, to, uh, to read about. So maybe it's not high on the priority list. Um, but it does seem like he just seemed to, he seemed like a very good diplomat. He was, he endeared himself to the French at a time when it was very important because um, after the revolution, before the War of 1812, Napoleon kind of ran the show, um, and it seemed like the you know the British for a while before Napoleon actually declared war on the British, the British were very did not care about Americans as neutral parties. So they ended up 
um, impressing American sailors. Now, impressing is not like, you know, you know, showing them something special. It's basically it's basically kidnapping them and forcing them into the, the British Navy. And through various negotiations that he got he got them the British to sign a treaty which they promptly ignored, um, where they basically would not stop their their the captains of the British Navy from doing this behavior. Um, but um, he seemed to have gotten a lot further than other diplomats had gotten with the British and the French, which is shows that he's able to talk to people and try to appeal to what's important to them while still getting what's important to to the United States. And he was able to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, this was during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it seemed like he stepped on uh, the other diplomat there, Robert, Robert Livingston's toes in claiming credit for this. Um, that apparently Livingston had been approached by a, a French uh, minister uh, about the possibility of buying parts of the Louisiana Territory, which had recently come under French control. Obviously, there wasn't very much there. It was open land, mostly just Indians living there. But it had sort of international respect as French property um, that they had gotten from the uh, Spanish. Um, it seemed like while Livingston kind of felt like he deserved credit, I think a lot of the heavy lifting was done by um, by James Madison. But it seems like they both deserved credit, and Livingston uh, and uh, never really forgave him for uh, claiming credit for that. Um, it also seems like if you look at the the man himself, like I, the the previous book. A review that I did about a president was about James Madison, and I felt like it was missing a lot about his family. Well, he got it in spades there. I got maybe a little too much about his fam about Monroe's family in this, um, that he was very devoted to his wife uh, and his children, um, often too devoted to his brothers and his cousins who um, ended up being a major burden on there. It was just a bunch of ne'er-do-wells, always asking for money, always getting into trouble and him, always because of his connections and his ability to drum up money, uh, was able to bail them out. And it really ended up to his own detriment to do that. Um, um, he often got on the wrong side of business deals. Um, there's an example when he was a diplomat over in France and he was over there for a couple of years, he decided that he was going, he was given the, um, the permission to buy property on behalf of the American government, and he used his own money as a you know to, to front the, the the sale of this, and he never got paid back for this. So he bought essentially a home for the, the main diplomat. I don't even think they called him ambassadors at that point. They were just called like Minister de France, American Minister de France, or something like that. And he never got paid back for it. He went deep into debt in that. Each time that he'd come back from whatever job he was doing, he went. To become a lawyer, um, sometimes in Richmond or in Williamsburg or in um, Fredericksburg, that he was able to, to drum up a little bit more money. And then some other disaster came around when he had to pay for somebody. And it, it just seemed like he just couldn't, couldn't win as far as the money was concerned. Although it's, it does seem like most of the founding fathers, um, James Madison, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, those, especially those two, uh, were not very good with money. They were very good at being politicians and, and laying the, the groundwork for the United States and becoming, you know, the important men in uh, the early days of the United States, but they could not balance a checkbook. And this, unfortunately, the same was true with uh, James Monroe. He just didn't know how to say no to people. Um, so even even great men, and I'm not saying good men, but great men, big, you know, larger than life characters have flaws in, and they basically can't say no to people. Um, and so uh, let's we'll see what else. I have a couple notes here. So it seemed like he was fairly well liked by everyone involved. Now he, in the early days of the Republic, you had the two major factions. Now George Washington was very anti-party. 
like he did not like the idea of political parties because it basically comes what we see today, right? It's just, no, you're an asshole. You're an asshole, you know? And it was just pointing fingers and it got really bad. Um, it started under him, uh, but it got really bad under um, John Adams. And then under when Thomas Jefferson became president, it got bad, you know, it was back and forth. And um, even, so it, it was that, it was the case that the political parties became a problem, especially after George Washington died. But um, uh, he seemed to be very well liked by everybody, but he did have a falling out with James Madison, um, you know, his fellow Virginian, um, uh, over a treaty um, which was known as the Monroe Pinckney Treaty, which was essentially trying to stop British, um, British from kidnapping American sailors and impressing them into the British Navy. Um, and this was basically over the question of citizenship that if, you know, oh, if you were born in Britain, then you'll always be British. So therefore we're stealing you and we're putting you in the Navy. Well, the, these people had left when they were children. So they're not really British anymore. And plus you could say that about the entire country of America at that point, that most of the people in America at that point were born under British, you know, sub, you know, subjection is that they were, you know, subjects of the British Empire before the revolution. So you could technically call them British, um, although they had basically become a different country. And so you can't really claim that anyway. So uh, Madison Monroe had a falling out for a while, and then he was able to come back. They were able to make amends when Monroe uh, asked him to be his uh, Secretary of State. Now, this was important because he was there to try to negotiate a peace before the War of 1812 was about to break out. Um, and it, it this is the, actually the war itself is less interesting than what Monroe actually did beyond his the scope of his job as Secretary of State. So, in the war itself, it was largely. Um, the United States, at very early in the war, decided that they were going to go start attacking ports. So they attacked um, Fort Erie, which is right over the river from Buffalo. Um, and then they went up to what is now called, um, what is now Toronto. I think they called it York, but York is a little like suburb of, of uh, Toronto um, today. And they start making attacks up in around... Montreal never really got anywhere, but they did burn York to the ground. Uh, so the British sort of responded by sending their fleet down up the uh, up the Chesapeake Bay, up the Potomac River, and were about were stationed about 20, 30, 40 miles somewhere around there outside of Washington as a sort of camp, scaring the crap out of everyone who lived in Washington because most of these people were not military people. They'd never really fought. They never really knew anything about war. And everybody was running around with their, head, their hair on fire. And the British were just bombarding Washington, which at the time was nothing like it didn't even have paved roads. Um, it was mostly, mostly like pig farms. And but so they were building the, um, the white, what is now the White House. And that was set on fire. And everybody just started leaving the city. Um, they just totally abandoned Washington, not that there was much to abandon. And Monroe was just standing around like, why am I the only one who's willing to, to do anything about that? He said, screw this. I'm going to grab a bunch of people. You know, I'm going to you know, sort of rally a bunch of soldiers and we're going to go chasing these British. And so they chased them all over Maryland. Um, uh, so they chased them outside of Washington, D.C. Up, it was, I think the area is like Bladensburg, which... Um, uh, I know because my mother has been sort of um, in, a, in a hospital uh, facility there today, um, and at least along the way. And so he had basically been fighting them, trying to keep them outside of cities, uh, and then they had forces coming down from Baltimore just trying to contain them until they basically, the British just decided to abandon the whole thing and, and just say, this is not worth it. Um, but they did manage to get the White House. Um, so he effectively ran the government for a couple of years because James Monroe 
had no control over anything and just ran off to the countryside along with the rest of the cabinet. And so he was essentially forced to become a general. This is James Madison, become the general uh, of the United States. And um, although it wasn't a formal position, but if you're defending your country and you're the only like officer doing it, you're, the effect, you're effectively de facto the the governor, or not the governor, the, the the general of the United States, and he seemed to do a fairly good job of it. And then he was able to negotiate the treaty afterwards. Um, and so when James Monroe had basically said, "I'm I'm done with this," um, he also James Monroe actually got kind of sick, and so it was kind of obvious that he was not going to run for a third term. Um, and so everyone looked at James Madison like, "Like you're the only sane guy in the room," and you know most of the the, the uh, the founding fathers were either dead or really old at this point. You're talking about um, 1817 when James Monroe became uh, president. That was, you know, that's 41 years after the Declaration of Independence. Um, James Monroe was just a kid. He was like 18, 19, 20, somewhere like that when that happened. So 40 years after that, he's now 60. Um, getting kind of old, but still, you know, with it. And so he becomes president and he becomes, he becomes actually very popular. Um, and uh, he runs fairly unimposed. Um, the, so that's, as I mentioned, the party system, which was the Federals versus the uh, Republican Democrats, the usually short term it to uh, the Republicans. Um Basically, the Federalist Party just totally collapsed, and there was no party system at the time. Basically, the party system just completely disappeared. And this era um, was called the era of good feelings. And so in this post-war sort of, I wouldn't call it, you know, celebration, but kind of like, yeah, we fought our, you know, we won our independence and we, we kept it in the second war. Uh, and so... And then when the Americans, were, you know, that they felt comfortable that this was their land and it was not going to be taken away from them, uh, James Madison basically encouraged Americans to move west. Um, and so Americans just rushed to claim whatever land they could do west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and the other thing about his um, uh, presidency, I, I guess I'll just wrap it up, is the obvious um, thing is the uh, Monroe Doctrine which uh, he issued uh, as a sort of foreign policy statement of the United States, which I guess up until this day, it's no longer really talked about in the same way, mostly because it's kind of settled. It's just the way things are, uh, is the Monroe Doctrine, which basically says that our foreign policy is American foreign policy is that we will not allow foreign countries to establish any new colonial efforts in the new world, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so basically this is um, supporting uh, all of the new republics that were forming in South America. So a lot of people like Simon Bolivar were very in support of this because obviously this is a tacit, uh, not even tacit, it's pretty open support for any country who wants to become its own republic uh, to sort of get rid of its colonial masters. Um, they were very happy with this because it basically gave them, it greenlit them to go, you know, get rid of the Spanish. Although the Spanish were not very, um, it wasn't a very difficult job for the, you know, the Latin Americans to get rid of them because Spain was kind of a husk of what it once was. Um, and so foreign, foreign response to this was that foreign nations were either outraged. How dare you do this? How dare you tell us not to do this? Uh, the, the, um, uh, Foreign Minister Metternich of, of Austria he was was outraged about this, and he's like, "Who cares? You're landlocked. Shut up." You know, um, and other ones like the French or the Spanish just ignored it. Um, but the British actually liked it because they wanted neutrality on the seas, and because they were a small country compared to France or Germany or Austria. They, the British, got their power by building a navy. Since America really wanted a neutral system, 
in the ocean. The British were all on board with that. Yeah, sure. So the, the British were basically ran the seas during the Napoleon era. And this is what caused the War of 1812, is that basically they were stealing ships uh, because they didn't want anybody who wasn't British uh, sailing on the sea. And so afterwards, they, they decided that they were going to approve of this, uh, of the, the Monroe Doctrine, um, because it kind of said, like, look, America maintains this policy of neutrality on the seas, and nobody knew it was going to come in. And so the British at this point had colonized every place that they really wanted to colonize in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, which is like Canada, the Caribbean islands, I think even the Mosquito Coast, which is now called Belize. Um, they basically had everything that they wanted didn't want anybody new coming in and the way the way they were going to gain power in the new world was just really hard at it for trade they had switched from a very pro mercantile policy which is basically we only trade with our colonies nobody else is allowed to trade with them um and they decided they were going to change that system that anybody can trade with anything anybody at any time so long as it wasn't forced um, which is kind of the system we have today um they prefer this rather than claim land for colonization because it's very expensive. You have to defend it and it gets you into all kinds of war. Um, and so it seemed like Monroe was a pretty good president. I mean, he, he left the country in a very good spot. Unfortunately, right after his, president, his second term as president, he, uh, it, there was a very contentious election between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, who was a... Um, uh, general during the uh, 18 the war of 1812 um but that's another story for another book but the book itself is pretty good um like i say is very a little too pro uh james madison even to the detriment of people like george washington who you know you don't touch george washington in american history although you know he wasn't perfect but um we, i think by and large, it was a little too heavy-handed with the praise for him. Although it does seem like, you know, the more you read about him elsewhere, he does seem like to be a, a pretty, just an all-rounder. Um, and we don't really have people like that today. So um, I'm looking forward to the next one. There's John Quincy Adams. I um, might head up to the library today and check that out. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I do these occasionally when it's something worth talking about. Uh, I love American history. I have a, a bachelor's degree in it. Uh, I don't do much about American history other than read it and talk about it. Um, but um, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello.